Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, with us today, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good day, Rob. Steven, how are you? I'm doing good. And uh, of course, our endless uh, list of amazing guests continue. And I'm excited to have uh, Dave Nielsen here, who's the head of ecosystem programs at Redis Lab. And I know a lot of people know uh, Dave from, you know, Cloud Camp from, which seems like a long time ago, which is quite shocking. But Dave, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. You know, it's great to be back. Yeah, you know, uh, Cloud Camp was started almost 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of weird to think about. So, uh, Can you, uh, you know, before we get going, you know, tell us any other, you know, interesting things about your background or something like that, that people may want to know? Yeah, well, you know, I was super in the kind of mix of things with that Cloud Camp series. Uh, then ended up having, uh, starting a family, so kind of cooled off on all the travel and all the extra time. Um, ended up at Redis Labs, which some people know about, uh, but I took a left turn and went to Intel for a year and a half, where I actually really enjoyed my time over at Intel, uh, learning about deep learning. Um, but, you know, big company, just not quite my thing, and I couldn't really figure out and navigate like a career path there. So when I got the opportunity to come back and head up ecosystem programs at Redis Labs, um, you know, the company's growing fast. It just seemed like such a great opportunity. So I took it and, um, and have been back for about a little over a month now. Great. Well, Rob, should we get going? I'm, I'm ready to dig in. One of the things I All love right. about David is he's super curious about a lot of things. So we have plenty of topics we can cover. That's right. Uh, and I've had my coffee. Ooh. ooh okay. Uh, I'm jealous. Watch out. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's always useful sort of the ground, help people ground out on where you are sort of right now. Like, so from a Redis Labs or Redis Lab, no S perspective. There is an S. Redis Labs. It is Labs. Okay. More than one lab. Yeah. Um, and so you want to describe very briefly, Red, you know, what Redis Redis Lab does, and and sort of how it fits, and then we can we can sort of dig deeper into where that ends up applying in a whole bunch of cool technology areas. Yeah, actually, that's pretty relevant too. And so a lot of people know about Redis and we are the quote unquote home of Redis, but what does that mean? And um, actually just getting to know the open source project versus the company actually is kind of interesting um, as opposed to other uh, stories sometimes. Um, so for those who know, uh, who know Redis, Redis was created by Salvatore uh, San Felipe and, uh, or San Felipe, sorry. And he is based out of um, Italy and uh, actually in Sicily, not really the kind of place you think of a hotbed of, uh, you know, internet innovation. But I guess if you, um, if you've got time to think and uh, quiet around you, maybe, maybe that's the trick, you know, um, and a sense of urgency, you know, he's got a, he's got a volcano out, out his window that erupts every once in a while. So, you know, you don't want to like put off those important uh, projects too long. So I, you know, I think it works for him because he gets a lot done. And um, the project was uh, not only, uh, I think an excellent project from the beginning, he's solving some problems in uh, trying to do high performance, um, you know, uh, in memory um, uh, data processing, et cetera. And uh, it just took off. And a lot of people know the story about how it just, um, you know, solved problems for companies like Twitter and, you know, problems that just weren't solvable any other way. And it just took off. You released it as a BSD, a free BSD license. So it, um, it's, it's uh, you know, used wildly all over the place, including most of the clouds. And what happened was um, lots of companies decided to pop up and take that product and start providing services and uh, around it, including a company called, that eventually called itself Redis Labs. And uh, so the project is Salvatore's project. It is run independently. It's mostly um, managed and created by him. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it really is a, a pure open source project in that sense. Now where Redis Labs comes in is at some point, 
um, Redis Labs really took the lead in providing commercial services, it became pretty obvious that there weren't other companies that were keeping up and Redis Labs raised a bunch of money and started, you know, putting a really solid um, uh, sort of enterprise package around it. And there's a, a very simple delineation, I think, the, to separate the two. So if you're out there and you're looking to um, use Redis, if you're just using Redis for one or two instances, I mean, you should just use open source Redis. It's, it's, it's incredibly good at that. It, it's crazy stable. I know people who've had their instance running and they're like, well, let me go check and see how long it's been running. Oh, wow, this thing's been running for 60 months, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, so, and, and, you know, but at the, at the enterprise level, when it comes to like scaling out and you have like lots of different instances that you're running and you don't want it to ever go down, uh, Redis Labs has a lot of stability at, at, the, at the high end and you can definitely check it out in that regard. And, and we also run it as a service and that's kind of how we got our beginnings, which was, I think at this point we've now, we're running something like 200,000 Redis instances as a service on multiple clouds. So anyway, yeah, the company's doing great and, and uh, open source is doing great. So, it's, so, so I, you, you did, a, did a really good job telling us all about Redis and Redis Labs. For people who don't know what Redis is, it, it's an in-memory database, super fast key value store is the very simple. What? Sort of. There are people out there who don't know what Redis, or Redis is? Um, I guess you're right. But, um, and, uh, and, and that's relevant for people solving um, a lot of the problems where you need to store state, right? It, 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 so Redis, to me, we have a huge state problem. Um, and I'm not talking about government state. I'm talking... <laughs> I, I'm talking about, uh, you know, containers and stateless and applications where you need to store state because you're doing a process that's sort of short lived or you're doing a function and you need a place to sort of put that while, while you do other work or while the user, you know, clicks, clicks amount, uh, you know, types additional characters or something like that is, or what, what use cases do you see as, as most motivational for people? Yeah, actually that's a great way to put it. Um, you know, you need a place to store state. You know, it, it started off with one data structure and that was a data structure to essentially um, store data that was ingesting faster than the database could handle. So, you know, you have all this data coming in and you're trying to dump it into a MySQL and MySQL couldn't handle, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of, of writes per second. Um, and so what would happen is he, he, after trying to get MySQL to do all this, he finally decided that there was, it was impossible. And so he was gonna essentially create a queue in memory so that the data could come in, it could be stored in some like long queue, and then you can take like a thousand writes at a time and dump them into uh, MySQL. And so MySQL can handle that far better than it could, you know, a thousand individual writes. And, and so that was, that's kind of one data structure. and. Um, you know, at the time, Memcached already existed, so he didn't really solve that problem right away, but he had all these other problems that he was starting to do, like uh, leaderboard type problems where you, you just simply want to know, you know, all these API calls are coming in and you want to know what is the most popular error message. So, uh, you know, you can create what is now called a sorted set where you just simply add your error message to the set and every time you do that, it increments the, the, the score for that string and the structure automatically resorts itself based on the most popular scores, you know, the highest scores. So you have basically this real-time leaderboard. And there's just tons of these things that you need to do that, um, you know, doing it in memory is the best place because it's the fastest. You know, you don't really need to know every single change to the leaderboard. You just want to know maybe at the end of the day what the most number of writes were, so writing to disk doesn't really, it's not necessary. Um, and then he started adding in other, other types like session state, like you talked about, which is really just a hash where you have multiple fields that you're storing in memory and you can set it up so that you're putting in like it maybe the, uh, the cookie, maybe the, if, if the person's logged in, um, you've got their user ID, you've got some sort of automatic timeout so that it expires automatically after 20 minutes. You can put all your hit counters in there. So every time the person comes back, you know, can increment. 
So there's lots of that kind of information that got put into Redis and, and, and all different data structures. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you my, my first sort of experience of why you really needed something like Redis and you're naming exactly what it was. We would, people forgive me, we used to do a ton of Ruby on Rails. And if you wanted to scale Ruby out like Twitter uh, back in the day uh, did, then you would need a way for, you'd load balance all those web servers and then each the user session would need to be reset, re, re, recovered into the stack, depending on which server it hits. So Redis would be the session store behind a whole bunch of front end web servers. This is a really simple example. Yeah. But you, you and I started this, started the, the, the conversation that led to this saying, let's, let's talk about this on the podcast was, was taking not the more traditional uses of Redis um, and state store, but looking into edge infrastructure, which is one of our favorite topics, um, and, and thinking through what application delivery in an edge infrastructure would be. Um, and so I want to, I want to be mindful of the clock and, and dive in on that a little bit before, before we answer that question, can you define edge for us? <laughs> well, well, as a, you know, 10 year cloud veteran, I think that, um, edge to me feels like anything where your quote unquote central processing is no longer, you know, isn't in the cloud, so to speak. That's what it feels like to me. Um, okay. And so it almost feels like anything outside of the cloud that might ultimately end up in the cloud, but you needed to get, it made sense for you to do some, some of the work um, out on the edge closer to where the data is being generated or, you know, needs to be evaluated because doing the whole round trip every time is either impossible or just takes too long or is just a waste of you know, resources. Right, I, I, and I, I like that definition, right? To me, it's, you're, not, you're not saying, oh, it's within X latency and, and all these things. It's really, hey, it's not, the centralized cloud is not the, not the place. It's, you know, it has to be done on site, in location. That makes a lot of sense. But Red, I mean, Redis by and large has been used as a cloud infrastructure, as part of an application stack, uh, the edge architecture is different, um, right? You're talking about IoT, low power IoT devices, much more limited footprints. Can you, can, is there a scenario that, that you're seeing or thinking about from an edge perspective? Yeah, so first, the first interesting thing about Redis in this context is that Salvatore, he has essentially evaluated almost every single line of code that's gone into Redis um, for many reasons. One is quality, of course. Some people say that like, just to study the Redis source code is a, an excellent study in programming because of the quality of the code. Um, also, he, makes a, he puts in a significant effort to make sure that duplicate code is not written. So if, if somebody submits some code um, and like, for example, geos, geospatial, um, uh, data structures. It, the, the person who wrote it, I think, did a great, apparently did a great job, but there was a lot of duplicate code in there. So uh, Salvatore ended up, um, you know, rewriting a bunch of it to reuse code. And so the, the overall footprint is somewhere, I think it's somewhere around 20 megabytes, which is really small for a database. And it can run out on the edge and do some pretty interesting things. So that's, that's the first thing that's relevant. The second thing is that the, that first use case that I shared where there was ingesting this data, well, that, that's kind of an IoT, kind of an IoT use case, right? Where you, know, you got all these metrics or other values um, hitting, coming in hard, and you got to figure out a way to you know, get them to where they need to go permanently. And so, you know, Redis has been doing that um, for an adjacent market for, for you know, eight years. And... Um, uh, you know, Kafka kind of came in and started um, solving that problem in a complete sense. And I think finally with Redis Streams that um, was announced a year ago, and I think is going GA sometime this year in the next few months, um, you know, Redis will be able to uh, solve that problem in a very Kafka sort of way, um, meaning, you know, a, a complete solution to get your data from the edge to, um, you know, some, some destination and do some processing along the way. Right. So, and Kafka, Kafka is all about doing stream analytics. Um, 
as as the data is being analyzed. And so, yeah, if Redis has that capability. So the interesting thing you're describing to me is one of the sort of common acknowledgements with edge infrastructure, which is a lot more data is generated at the edge than you can or want to upload. So if you're in an edge infrastructure perspective, you might have IoT devices or cameras or things like that, that you, you don't want to just dump all of that data, all of that video, all that sound, you know, into the cloud for analytics, right? You actually might want to do some trending. You might want to apply some models. You're going to minimize the, the four data, but to do that, you still need a place to store it temporarily. You need, you need some, something to, to sort of, you do stream analytics. These are real use cases that you're, you're going to have to deal with on the edge because you just can't, you don't, you can't send every frame of video that you take uh, up to the cloud for processing. That, that seems like overkill to me. Right. Oh yeah. And you couldn't do it in many cases. It just wouldn't, you know, the, the pipe just can't handle it. Right. And then the same thing is true. You're not going to put, uh, you know, a heavyweight relational database ingesting all that data. You need, you know, size, size, and performance and scale all matter in these infrastructures. Yeah, sure. I mean, a good, another good example would be something like rate limiting. You know, if, if you're out in the edge and you, you know that you're going to limit your customers to a certain amount of usage, because maybe that's what they have paid for, or you know you just don't need more than that, um, or you're afraid of, you know, getting, you know, maybe you're kind of open on the edge and so you're, you know, uh, you could get hacked or, or get some denial of service going on, on out there, then doing some sort of um, some, some rate limiting on the edge would, would make a lot of sense. And that's very easy to do in Redis. Right. No, that makes, that's, that's an important component. Do you see it being paired from that perspective with other platforms from an edge perspective? Like, do you see a Kubernetes cluster, you know, with a Redis component in it? I mean, how, how would, what's what's the whole platform because redis itself is not the complete platform do you, do you think that that people are going to have sort of a a platform piece in these these edge infrastructures yeah I, you know i would assume so it's sort of early for me to understand that whole space Fair enough. but redis is incredibly popular in kubernetes and docker and you know those types of solutions um so I, I would I would imagine that it would be paired up that way if that if, if customers choose Kubernetes down at the edge. Uh, for example, Redis is the most popular database um, downloaded off of Docker Hub by far. Like just it blows off the way. So yeah, I, I would imagine that. Right. So now we've we've got uh, some type of some type of platform. Redis becomes your session store, your state store as part of an intermediate. Um, do you think? You know, maybe this is I'm not sure how, how to ask this question in a meaningful way. That, but I'll try. Um, do you do you see uh, something like Kubernetes as uh, a winning platform for the edge? Is is so? I guess first, does does Edge need a platform? And do you do you see winners or you know that that would shape up for that? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. It it seems less. Um, about scale, which is what Kubernetes, you know, is and, and containers are are helping with, you know, in a dramatic fashion. Um, at least, you know, on the edge, do you do you, you have most likely some sort of limited footprint? So I'm not sure that it's going to be useful in that way. I think it might be much more useful just simply in its packaging of the code and of, of you know containers. And it's you know that itself is is a you know, some might argue even more valuable um, from a container perspective. So, um, you know, maybe it gets used in that regards as a as a, mm. you know, a scheduler to help figure out when to deploy out to the edge, and then provide a place for the you know those containers to land. Um, but if, I don't know. I mean, if, you, if you're gonna, if somebody gives me a container, I, I'm I don't want to write a a way to schedule it. So it, it's I'm gonna end up using you know, Kubernetes, most likely Kubernetes to it, it. So as an operator, yeah. if, if you said, I wrote this cool con application is containerized. Yay. It's got all these things in it. Right. And you know, you're like, and it's going to use Redis. Yay. And what I'd probably tell you to do is give me, you know, we'll put everything in containers 
you've already done it, right? Make sure it's that way. And I'm going to uh, basically use a Helm chart or something to spin up those containers. And I want, I want Kubernetes to do it because I don't want to write a, another way to get the containers started. It's, it's not even, a, there's a lot of power in Kubernetes that you could use to manage, you know, keep the app up and all that stuff. But some of it's just, I need an API that says start containers on my cluster and I don't want to have to worry about which machines are in my cluster or anything like that. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, make, it makes sense to me. I just haven't done it. I haven't been out on the edge to see what actually gets deployed and you know, how much of it is, is one like on the edge, I keep thinking of smaller devices, but maybe they're much larger devices. In fact, we should talk about that in a minute, but sure. um, you know, if maybe all you have to do is push one container down to the edge, I don't know. Is that, is that, is, is Kubernetes overkill for that? Or is it the perfect tool? I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so this is, this is where in, in our conversation, we, we sort of went two different ways and, and let's jump. I want to jump down both of them at, at first, but you, you hit sort of one of my favorite um, edge rethinking type of sort of places, which is it's not a matter with pushing a container to the edge. Um, <laughs> which to me sounds like, oh, I've got a little data center sitting, you know, in my neighborhood and I'm going to container deploy to Rob's, you know, local data center. It's, I've got a container and I want to globally distribute it to neighborhood data centers in a, in North America um, in time for the, you know, the Super Bowl um, to spin up, you know. Um, right. and, and that is one container deployed to, a thousand or 10,000 data centers. It's, it's a totally different problem than, you know, run a container in Kubernetes um, right. because now, your management well, problem is, is not a single cluster problem. It's a uh, thousands of cluster problems. Okay. I got to ask you one question. Yeah. Who has, where are these containers in, in neighborhoods? Like are they in cell towers or are they in, like at the at the um, at the central off the CO, like where are these things? So there, there, these things are actually in existence, but they're not shared infrastructure thing. They're not shared infrastructure. So uh, content delivery networks (CDNs) mm -hmm. um, have point of presence in major markets in the 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 colo pops or in the you know um, the streaming you know where where you have your 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 internet provider, your ISP, I'm resisting naming names. Um, and, you know, they have a point of presence pop uh, in the, in the regions where they have to deliver that content. And then they, they want, um, they sell that, the access to that space to a very small number of people uh, who are providing content delivery uh, or content distribution networks um, to stage content there. Um, Today, those, those are very specialized. They're managed in, in very um, specialized ways and they're not accessible as a, like a cloud would be where you can like, I just need to run a container. Who can run a container? Um, but yeah, the, the infrastructure's there. Um, there's a lot of people talk in edge about the coming infrastructure with 5G cell phone towers and um, I was just listening to um, Derek Coulson and Brian Gracely on the Cloudcast talking about their their his vision, uh, Derek's vision of um, Edge, which is very 5G. Um, sort of, you know, everybody gives up Wi-Fi in favor of 5G type things, um, and those are very real considerations, right? Uh, they're not here yet, but that's that's pretty clear that we're going to have geographically distributed. Um, little data centers to manage autonomous cars and people's home networks and augmented reality. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't want to go deep in that. You, if people are interested in all the, the cool potential what ifs on why edge, then there, there's plenty of papers and podcasts about that. But I'd, I'd, right. rather, I'd rather talk about the hows, not the, not the what's. No, I was just kind of, I wanted, I wanted to get a bit better picture. I remember, um, and, and yeah, we should move on, but I remember like, gosh, I don't know eight years ago, seven years ago, I remember Akamai had the ability to, you know, push JavaScript out to the edge somewhere. Oh. So, so I, I mean, there's companies that have been doing stuff like this, but I think, I think somehow either probably containers themselves have, have helped change the dynamic. But 
but this is, and this to me is really important. So there's a, there's a very fascinating difference between CDN, which is a distributed store, um, and a container, which is actually a compute vehicle and pushing compute capa ca capacity down into those local resources. And so I think it's fascinating, right? And, and Redis is an interesting thing because you're right in the middle between storage and process, right? You are, you know, that, that's what makes this, makes this sort of tease up this conversation in a really exciting way is you, it's, that, it's that buffer. Um, but to me, that's, this is where we're really talking about a, a transformation in edge from a storage network at, at the edge to a compute network at the edge. Yeah. No, I see it. And, and, and a lot of this um, machine learning that's going on, you, you, you're, there are a lot of folks are going to want to put the, you know, the machine learning algorithm that gets created you know, out onto the edge to start scoring data or you know, processing data. Um, that, that's going to make a lot of sense too. Yeah. Okay. So what does it look like out there? You've got um, like, like, how do you do that? But if you're a big company and you've already, you're working with some big CDN, I guess, you know, maybe that looks a little bit more like your traditional um, operational environment where you can push out a container, but you know, it, first of all, is that, <laughs> is that the way it is? And then also what about smaller environments or more, you know, home environments or, or, you know, make environments? So, so um, let, let's skip over the wasteland of IT infrastructure management at the edge, because uh, that's a wasteland, um, and then jump into the smaller hardware, because right. because I know I know you have something on your mind for that. So what do you mean? Well, so okay, for the first the first question is, for me is you know whenever I go to Hacker Dojo or one of the you know work maker spaces you see people playing around with stuff and, you know, you might see a Raspberry Pi. In fact, we have Redis running on a Raspberry Pi. Yep. Um, and, you know, to me, I understand that it's pretty simple. You've, you've basically got a, a small footprint, but you can, you can do quite a lot in there, you know, and it can sense things. You can hook up other, um, you know, real, um, uh, interactive devices to it, you know, um, motion sensors, all this kind of stuff, but that's one device running your container or, you know, your code. What, and to me, that's fairly simple. I mean, maybe it's not easy to deploy your code out there, but like that I get. Sure. What I start having challenges with is, okay, if that's not talking all the way to the cloud, which of course it could, if you're connected, you know, Wi-Fi or something, but if that's not connecting to the cloud, maybe there's gotta be some device in that um, warehouse or manufacturing floor or something that's acting as like a edge hub collecting some data. And so what does that look like? What are the, uh, what does it look like where you have some sort of edge hub receiving information from these devices? And is that a common scenario or is that um, like rare? So today, most of the edge devices. So if I, if I wrote some software, put it on a Raspberry Pi and, and put it in my house, or if I bought an Alexa or a dot or any, you know, Google Home, all those things are going to connect back to the cloud. Um, they don't connect to some intermediate infrastructure in the mix. Um, but I, I mean, this is this is where it gets a little bit weird because I, I, we talked to tons of people who are trying to build like little Raspberry Pi clusters. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've played with Raspberry Pis just because we were like, oh, that would be cool. Maybe we can get them to Pixie Boot and do some actual IT management uh, drills on them which they, it's not their design pattern. There's no management, real management paradigm around a Pi. Um, they're, they're great for home lab stuff. You can, you can manage them. I don't know, you and I were sharing some scripts that somebody had written that um, <laughs> did, some, did some jump around with, with a uh, in-memory partition and, and SSH and Puppet and things like that. Um, uh, it's, it doesn't, you know, we talk to people who want to try and manage this stuff. It, it's not about running the compute to me. It, it's about management. When you become a company trying to build a distributed architecture where you have thousands of, or hundreds of thousands of devices, uh, the management's a real concern, right? Yeah. Or maybe I'm missing your, maybe I'm missing where you want to talk. 
Well, so the, at the end of the day, if I was putting on my um, Redis Labs ecosystem programs hat, you know, what I'm trying to figure out is what, what is the hot um, ecosystem where there's a lot of movement and a lot of innovation going on where I can get in there and, and help those innovators, you know, solve some problems that only Redis is good at. And, you know, the, you know, the, the easiest way for me to do my job is, is to find the, the one that's got the lowest barrier, um, where there's, you know, in Raspberry Pi obviously is a low barrier because of cost. Sure. Um, you know, there's others, there's Arduino, there's Lenino, there's, you know, the, the Intel Nuke, um, uh -huh. you know, that we mentioned earlier. And next, so, next unit of compute or new unit of compute type thing. Yep. Yeah. And so, um, you know, those all have um, audiences that uh, are either growing or, or have already grown and there's already like a large base, but that doesn't right. necessarily mean they're going to get, you know, picked up and commercialized in an, an effective way. You know, we all but know. Those, are, those are designed as end units, right? They're the, the in-field endpoint that, that we're talking about. They're, they're you know, if you write software and I, somebody did, I'm trying to remember the name of the company, um, you know, has a way to run a con literally a container on those, some of those devices so you can distribute your code in a container and then do live swaps of your, you know, of the code base in them, right? Patching and maintaining an end device is a significant IOT problem. And I would actually say IOT more than edge. Um, although it's, it's an edge as much as anything else, but in those cases, it's a single function device. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you deploy it to do X. It's not a generic, uh, hub it hub for your, your house, right. Or your data center is not running your integrating traffic signals for your car. It's, it's, it is the thing actually do, you know, it's the sensor. Right. Um, and we, we certainly have to manage those things. They become security vulnerabilities if, if somebody can break into a poorly secured um, Nook or Pi or, or you know, Arduino. Um, and you can't push, it's hard to push code, right? There's, those are, there's uh, the famous story of you know, somebody you know, breaking everybody's door locks with a bad firmware patch. Um, right. I guess, I guess I think of those things as firmware. Um, more than I think of, of them as IT operations infrastructure. Yeah, and is that because the, the hardware and the software are tightly more tightly integrated than, you know, than, than we're used to? Uh, that, but also with their function, their function specific. Yeah. Um, they're not general purpose compute. And, and if you look at how they're designed, they don't have external management, um, right? We've looked at, say, the nooks, we've looked at the pies, they don't have out of band management. Uh, Nooks marginally have out of band management. I know somebody's going to say, "Well, they have this thing that you can send a magic packet." Um, they they do, but it's not really what we would think of from an IT perspective of like out of band IPMI uh, management, right? IP management interface type stuff. And we need those things in IT infrastructure because they provide a secondary control channel. Um, and, and so what does that look like? Cause I, you know, we're, we're now getting out of, um, well, actually let me back up for a second. Sure. So these individual devices out there, you know, the raspberry Pi, et cetera, like to me, they're low hanging fruit because there's so many people who've picked one up and figured out how to use it for a specific purpose. So there's a lot of them out there, you know, actively solving, you know, their own problems. Um, it's it's very fragmented. I'm not sure how you actually go out and talk to that market in a you know uh, scalable way. Um, so, what also is attractive to me is the folks who are acting as more like the hub that these devices talk to, so that you can pull some of the management, um, you know, general usage out of the device, stick it in some hub somewhere, so that um, you know some of the some of the power is, is now uh, centralized out, but still out on the edge somewhere. I mean, is that something you see? 
Uh, so in those cases, I would say that's, you know, use Kubernetes. If you, if you want to create an abstraction, don't get confused by the hardware. Right. You, you know, you want, you want a, an abstract, a software abstraction that allows you to deploy code, right. Consistently, you know, all over the place. If I'm a, if I'm a home user and I'm stacking up pies cause they're cheap, um, I would I would hope that I don't get confused by the fact that I could got I got a stack of pies working as a this is a useful IT infrastructure. Um, right. I, I, and that's you know I, I see that and I see you know with what we do, people come up and they're like you know they they want to get their hands on and and play with the, you know, our Pixie infrastructure technology, and it does a fair bit of automation. They want to get used to that and they want to do it at home and they, they don't have expensive infrastructure. And so they want to try and get pies and things like that working, which, which is logical. It's not a good proxy for what you would actually do in a data center, um, edge or otherwise, right? In an edge data center, truck rolls are super expensive. Right. You might not have physical access to that gear. You need, you can't be like, oops, I just made, you know, 10,000. I, I made a mistake and rolled it across 10,000 data centers. I sure hope that, you know, our, our truck roll budget can cover that. Uh -huh. So in your world, in your world, um, in fact, I read this article that was talking about uh, pushing uh, custom logic software out to, you know, 200, um, uh, like fulfillment centers or mm -hmm. I think it was like Royal Caribbean ships or yeah. even like 10,000, I forget what store it was, but like, let's just say 10,000 Taco Bells or something, sure. you or, know, or army bases, global army bases. Sure. Yeah. And Embassies. so each yeah. one of those is a data center in, in your world, right? Everyone is it infrastructure. Uh, I, I, I would, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about calling them data centers, although I would, I agree that they are. Um, but data centers seem to have a certain connotation with raised floor, security guards, internet, power, blah, blah, blah. You might have a 10 server rack blade frame sitting in the bottom of a cell phone base station that nobody would call a data center, yeah. but is IT infrastructure with, you know, man, you know, the same management needs as uh, a, a rack, right? Same thing, branch office, a retail, you know, center. It's which, which infrastructures in a lot of places. Yeah. Which, which is interesting because you know, that those have existed for years and nobody called them the edge, but now with this sort of cloud central world, those now ed, the term edge all of a sudden makes sense. They, well, they were, they were very much managed as a functional unit, um, special purpose thing. Um, I think when we talk about edge, we were thinking cloud and we're thinking about general function compute um, and general function tools. Yeah. Right. The, the, the edge is edge to the extent that you're using cloud technologies on it. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. I see what you're saying. But I was, I was thinking of it also being that, you know, it's the world has become very cloud centric, you mm -hmm. know, even public cloud, really. And and so, you know, the the edge is like where the cloud just can't really reach any further. You know, you're, you're from there on. It's no longer cloud. It's 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 you're now out in the, you know, the fingers of the real world um, that are talking to that edge device. And, and then the edge device is what's talking back to the cloud. That, that's to me what, what the words seem to I, I, And I think, I think a lot of people do see the edge as, as strictly the perimeter and cloud. Yeah. I think what the conversations that we've been having and the conversation we've had on this, you know, so far, um, shows that there's a intermediate set of infrastructure that's not big data center infrastructure like Amazon you think of for Amazon and it's not the peripheral edge device like a Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. or a sensor, but is something that is in situ IT infrastructure, right? Um, that, that has to have, you know, it's general purpose compute. It's running Kubernetes. It's running a container dot Redis would be a fine, you know, you'd put Redis on it as part of another application. Um, 
in those cases, that, that edge infrastructure, yeah, people, you know, not that long ago might have just called that on-premises IT equipment. Yeah. Um, or when I got out of graduate school, right, that, that was a programmable logic controller or a factory control system. The difference is they're, they're now connected to everything else. And the, the, those systems used to be very uh, hub and spoke where they were sort of hardwired into all the sensors. And now we're starting to say, hold on a second, I've got everything is an IP sensor and I might have one thing talk. It's just, we're, we're, we've dramatically inverted the control paradigm. Um, and, uh, you know, and an old, and a PLC model with wires doesn't keep. <laughs> I, you know, I wonder, there. I wonder as, you know, if I'm a developer listening to this podcast and I'm thinking, you know, I've got this really cool use case or app that I want to build that really needs to run in one of those, um, you know, edge uh, IT infrastructures. Um, how the heck do you actually get your code out there? <laughs> And thus we are back to the wasteland of, of IT, man, IT management uh, at the edge. People, <laughs> nobody, it's, it, to me, so, uh, and, and, and Stephen's about to wave me down and, and tackle me before us. So I'm not gonna bring this up as, a, as another topic um, in this conversation, but- As that, always happens, Rob. But that, <laughs> where we got to, Dave, that to me is the, the you know, the exciting new uncharted territory of what managing this highly distributed infrastructure, multi-tenant, all these, all these cool buzzwords that we're used to in cloud. It, nobody knows. We don't know yet. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of a cool use case. You know, we've, we've got Redis Conf um, coming up in April, I think the 22nd or something like that. I forgot. But anyway, it's, it's, um, it's near, near the end of April. Um, and there, you know, I'm, I'm helping out with some of the activities that we're going to do at the conference and some of the themes. And one of the activities is we're going to have, um, some game stations there. So people can come in and, uh, play some games. A lot of these games use Redis, but you could also sit and write some code. And I was also thinking, wouldn't it be kind of fun if you could write some code that actually interacted with the attendees at the conference? You know, could you like push out some code that would um, maybe uh, use some sensors as people walk through the conference halls or uh, push buttons, you know, at uh, kiosks, you know, or photo, you know, um, photo stations, whatever. And, um, you know, if you wrote your code and you wanted it to then tap into some of the devices there at the conference, how would you get it onto that, into that conference hall? And... There'd have to be obviously some, some, some sensors, but there might actually be like a, um, you know, a little, uh, a little station somewhere, a little um, uh, cabinet with, with some compute in it that's talking to all those folks, all those so devices. Dave, Dave, I think the solution to it is to write a big check to this little company called RackN. You may have heard of <laughs> and a team of RackN. We know how to fix that problem. Go in and uh, you know, do what it takes. And I'll get a big giant lifeguard chair and sit in the middle of the big hall where they work on it and have an iced tea or something like that. Oh man, that'd be fun. Um, so yeah, you could join good. me. But but Dave, we do we do need to wrap up. Um, before we go, if uh, any of the listeners want to get a hold of you, uh, track you down, where should they find you on the uh, interwebs? Yes, yes. Uh, the Twitters uh, is the easiest way to find me. It's Dave Nielsen. That's N I E L S E N on Twitter. You can also email me, uh, Dave at RedisLabs.com. Um, and you know, or find me out and about. I'm going to, my next stop next week, I'm going to be up at uh, the Helm summit in Portland, learning about, uh, how to, uh, Helmify Redis, um, in the Kubernetes world. And then I'm also going to be at IBM's, um, index conference, which is in San Francisco, I think on Thursday, I'll be speaking about um, analytics inside your, like real-time custom analytics per user um, using Redis. And that'll be in San Francisco. Or, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley, by the way. So if you haven't come to one of my meetups or something like that, or, or um, 
you know, one of my other events, definitely hit me up there. And finally, um, you've heard it here first. I am thinking, just thinking at this time, about pulling together some sort of like 10 year anniversary thing for Cloud Camp, which I think would be fun. Interesting. Yeah, maybe in uh, June. June 24th would be the actual anniversary, but it doesn't have to be on that date. I'll, I'll take a cruise ship to the Caribbean or something. Yeah, that could... don't don't take me to the same old place. <laughs> okay, yeah, something. We'll figure something out. But uh, anyway, that's where you can reach me. Okay, and uh, Dave, again, you know, for those of us here in Boise, I don't appreciate you did a uh, meetup for us, both the Boise DevOps meetup and the Cloud meetup, and uh, it was very successful here. So uh, you have a mini fan club uh, in the nether worlds of the mountains of Idaho. And, well, you know, that's a good place to go. There's some pretty good pretty good conversations going on there. So yeah, people would be surprised. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dave, thanks again for joining us. And uh, for some of the events you talked about that may have passed by the time this, this uh, podcast goes out, I'll make sure to include links to those videos and everything so people can find them, um, you know, if, if it comes out, uh, post those. So Dave and Rob, thank you again. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking again on another podcast in the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Have a good one.